First Avenue by Jonah Cromer Read by Jonah Cromer Reverend Grundmeier caught himself before he locked the door to the parsonage behind him. The newest pastor at the Lutheran Church on the north side of town, he was still getting used to the quirks of small-town living. Before beginning his daily walk, he let his gaze linger on the brand-new church, built only eight years before by the growing congregation he now shepherded. A generous flock, they not only gave him a salary and the parsonage, but when he accepted the call here two years ago, the Ladies' Guild raised enough money to gift him an AMC Eagle lift back in a lovely tan, wherein he again had to suppress his instinct to lock the doors as he set the grocery list for his wife next to the keys on the console. Folks around here did things differently. He didn't realize quite how much so until he made the school teacher who had grown up in the area into Mrs. Grundmeier just a few months prior. For her sake, he learned to trust not only the congregants he saw every Sunday, but the Catholics from down the road and the members of the two other Lutheran churches in town. Reverend Grundmeier began to walk south along First Avenue. He was headed toward uptown, or was it downtown, or perhaps midtown? In such a small settlement, it was hard to tell. Each town like this had one central street where most of the businesses were. Each of these streets had a classic-sounding name, he had come to learn. Others had Main Street, Broadway, or Center. Here, it was called First Avenue. As he passed, he admired the large walnut trees in front of the parochial grade school where his daughters were educated, the younger in preschool, the elder finishing the first grade. The budding branches were a beautiful sight on this unusually pleasant spring day, but, come the fall, they would drop their fruits and savagely stain the pavement green with their decaying husks. It was convenient living in the parsonage between the church and the school. On one side lay his office, his position as a spiritual leader. On the other lay his family, his wife teaching, and his daughters learning. The core of their world was a single block with one corner at the crossroads of the town's two highways. Reverend Grunmeyer stood on the corner of First Avenue and the highway, looking back and forth across its two lanes, slowed down to 35 miles per hour on its path between the two neighboring towns, that, despite their quirks, were fundamentally like it. There were two tractors at the stop sign looking to cross southward with him. This constituted heavy traffic in these parts. He waved at Dave and Leroy, who waved back from behind their respective wheels. After a couple of semis passed by, the pastor and Dave's John Deere journeyed southward, at first in tandem, until the mechanical acceleration of the tractor propelled Dave ahead of and beyond Reverend Grundmeier. Planting was just about finished, and, along with the other three pastors in town, he would continue to pray for good weather and productive days for the farmers who propelled the town's economy. The past few years had seen favorable harvests, and many members of his congregation had been able to pay off more of their debt and generously give enough to cover repair costs for the leaky parsonage roof. Reverend Grundmeier continued onward into the heart of town. On his left towered the distinctive village hall. Built in an architectural style that nobody could name, and with an oddly shaped tower protruding from the front left that had an open belfry poking out on top like a prairie dog from its hole, the town nonetheless embraced the century-old brick structure as one of its symbols. The town's services and offices had moved out of the building a score of years ago, and the interior was deteriorating. The fire department moved next door, the city offices and police department found a new home a couple blocks south, and the auditorium simply closed and was no longer that around which town life revolved. The lack of funding for repairs had led the city council to discuss selling the building for multiple years now, but no action was taken. The town's social center on Saturday nights was now the ballroom half a mile east, out on the edge of town. When visiting the ballroom earlier this year, Garrison Keeler had claimed on A Prairie Home Companion that this town had more hard maple flooring per capita than any other place on earth. Reverend Grundmeier figured that he was right. He had learned how to dance the polka on that flooring, with his wife bringing him up to speed in a few years. The annual polka festival always drew a big crowd from around the state and from those around it, and on that Sunday morning the church was always at its fullest, aside from Christmas Eve and Easter. Reverend Grundmeier stepped into the post office. There he was warmly greeted by Mary, who worked the desk, and Doc, the town veterinarian. Having apparently entered in the middle of a conversation, the reverend was asked how he thought the twins would be this year. 
As four eyes expectantly trained on his, he let out an exaggerated sigh. Well, they haven't looked too good, but if they get those young guys some experience, I reckon they could make a run. He continued. My cubs, though... Before trailing off and shaking his head. Doc and Mary laughed heartily before leaving him be and turning back to their intent baseball talk. Reverend Grundmeyer dropped an envelope in the out-of-town slot, a birthday card for his niece in Chicago. He opened his personal P.O. box and collected its contents before doing the same for the church's box. He unhurriedly stored the bills and letters into his briefcase. He bid goodbye to the post office's genially bickering occupants, who paused long enough to wish him a good day. Reverend Grundmeyer exited into the mid-morning summer sunlight, shining down onto First Avenue once more. There wasn't too much on the street these days, but still plenty enough for the pastor. The old brick storefronts weren't all occupied, yet the grocery, barber, and post office lined one side, while two banks, three saloons, and a bakery occupied the other. There was an old city ordinance that forbade women from entering the taverns after 10.30 p.m., but that was hard to enforce because two of the bar's proprietors were women. He didn't have the occasion to visit them often, but plenty of the folks he knew would turn out for one of the three competing Friday night meat raffles. Reverend Grundmeyer was more likely to be seen on summer Friday evenings giving his patronage to the popcorn wagon and walking with his family the block over to the band shell in City Park to hear the area band in concert. Reverend Grundmeyer strolled across the street in the middle of the block. As a younger man, he would never have done such a thing for fear of an encounter with an automobile racing by, but years ago, he finally understood that in this town, that simply was not a danger that he had to worry about. He stepped into the lobby of the state bank. He had no business to conduct today, but he always liked to chat with Hattie, one of the congregation's organists, who was a teller there. She asked how his new grandson was doing. He pulled out his cell phone and struggled with it until he was able to pull up a picture of the child. This bouncing young boy bore his name, and not even the July sun outside was beaming as brightly as the pastor's proud face. The conversation shifted naturally to the weather. Not too bad, but the crops could use some more rain. And the town ball team. Not too good, but they've only been getting better since they reformed a few years ago. Not wanting to waste too much of the bank's dime on chit-chat, as if he hadn't already, he bade Hattie farewell, promising to keep her in the loop on any news about his grandson. Reverend Grundmeyer walked down toward the community center. Out front of the squat building stood a new electronic sign. In between the cheesy transitions, it displayed information that was good to know. The town ball team would host a playoff game the next Sunday afternoon. The fire department chicken feed would be the Saturday after that, and the county fair would start in just two weeks. Before any of these, though, he had only a few days to plan his next sermon. It seemed like time was slipping further through his hands with each passing day, and he leaned on his God and his community to anchor him. His doctor instructed him to continue to take his daily walk and to reduce the amount of red meat and dairy in his diet. He was glad to do the first, well, at least four months out of the year, but he couldn't find it in himself to commit to the second. He was too stubborn. He'd done things this way for too long. He couldn't change now. He would collapse in the pulpit first. Reverend Grundmeyer stopped. This is where he would turn to go to coffee with the retired farmers down at the co-op, but something caught the corner of his mind and gave him pause. As he glanced down First Avenue in preparation to cross it, he noticed how different the town was than when he had arrived 40 years ago. The church was less and less full with each passing year. He hadn't performed more baptisms than funerals in decades. Two of those funerals this last year had been for old-timers Dave and Leroy. He lived modestly because the church couldn't afford to cover all of the parsonage upkeep. There had been talks of joining one of their sister churches in a double parish to keep afloat, but he did not want that happening on his watch. There were also talks of demolishing the village hall. It had been removed from the Register of Historic Places recently, and it was dangerous to go inside. The ballroom closed some years ago, 
as did one of the bars, the grocery store, the state bank, and the bakery. The empty storefronts well outnumbered those which housed the businesses that still managed to hang on by a thread. The change was slow, but steady. Demographic shifts did not favor this place. It seemed like a remnant of a time that few remembered. One of the few who could recall the jam-packed pancake feeds, the prosperity and camaraderie of the days gone by, and the tail end of this town's heyday, Reverend Grunmeyer suddenly felt burdened with the realization that few after him would know the joy of the way it was. He made up his mind. He would call his daughters and just talk about the way things were. After coffee, that is. You know, it was always the old-timers who would meet and chat at the co-op as the weed harvest rolled in. Nowadays, these old-timers were guys the pastor's age. How about that? Reverend Grunmeyer thought, and, finally, he crossed the street. Reverend Grundmeyer collapsed on the central yellow stripe. He clutched at his chest. Someone spotted him through the window of the hardware store and phoned emergency services. But Reverend Grundmeyer knew it. This was his time. His last walk down First Avenue ended here. The Lord was calling him from his adopted hometown to his heavenly home. Just as the paramedics arrived, Reverend Grundmeyer answered the call with a smile. A few days later, the bells of all four houses of worship tolled the noon hour. One by one, they faded out, until the last chiming came from the church with the parsonage next to it and the parochial grade school next to that. The somber ringing echoed through the abandoned downtown, uptown, or whatever. There were no cars parked along First Avenue there. The bank was closed, as was the post office, both bars, the community center, and the co-op. Anyone walking the street then could not be faulted for thinking that they walked through a ghost town, save for the last dying echoes of the Lutheran Church's bells. A few blocks north, however, the parking lot of that church was full. In fact, automobiles were parked up and down the block, around the back, and a quarter mile out into the country as well. For one last time, Reverend Grundmeyer filled the church where he had preached for just about his whole career. The pews so bare as of late now bore those who mourned the dead icon of a dying town. <laughs>